Please close the doors. May members take their seats. May we quiet down the chambers, please, as we begin. Members, please take your seats. The recess meeting of May 10th, 2017, held on May 24th, will be. I will call the meeting to order. May we now have a roll call on the recess meeting. Barron. Present. Borelli. Shh. Cabrera. Here. Chin. Here. Cohen. Constantinides. Cornegie. Present. Crowley. Shh. Combo. Deutsch. Right on. Drum. Here. Espinal. Here. Eugene. Ferreris Copeland. Here. Gorodnik. Here. Gentili. Here. Gibson. Greenfield. Grudenchik. Johnson. Here. Kalos. Here. King. Present. Thank you. Ku. Present. Kozlowitz. Here. Lanceman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Here. Levine. Here. Mizell. Here. Mealy. Menchaca. Presente. Mendez. Miller. Here. Palma. Here. Perkins. Here. Reynoso. Present. Richards. Shh. Richards. Present. Thank you. Rodriguez. Rose. Here. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Traeger. Shh. Ulrich. Present. Vaca. Here. Malone. Here. Williams. Here. Wills. Matteo. Van Bramer. Here. Speaker Mark Viverito. Thank you. I will now adjourn the recess meeting and I call to order the stated meeting of May 24th. May everyone please, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Chambers, please. We will now begin with a roll call. Barron. Present. Borelli. Cabrera. Here. Chin. Here. Cohen. Here. Constantinides. Here. Cornegie. Here. Crowley. <laughs> Combo. Deutsch. Here. Drum. Here. Espinal. Here. Eugene. Ferreris Copeland. Thank you. Gorodnik. Gentili. Here. Gibson. Greenfield. Grudenchek. Here. Johnson. Here. Kalos. Here. King. Here. Ku. Present. Kozlowitz. Here. Lanceman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Here. Levine. Here. Mizell. 
Mealy. Menchaca. Presente. Mendez. Miller. Thank you. Pama. Perkins. Present. Reynoso. Present. Richards. Present. Rodriguez. Rose. Rosenthal. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. Vaca. Ballone. Williams. Wills. Matteo. Van Bramer. Here. Speaker Mark Viverito. Thank you. All rise for the invocation. Bye. Quiet in the chambers. The invocation will be delivered by Reverend N. Joe Kim, who resides in the great borough of Queens. Quiet in the chambers, please. Would you bow your heads and join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the gathering of this stated meeting of our city council members, leaders who serve the over 8.5 million people of New York City and who represent the tremendous diversity of our great five boroughs. We are especially grateful to be celebrating AAPI heritage in this month of May, joining cities and states across the country in recognizing the contributions and achievements of our Asian American and Pacific Islands brothers and sisters. Indeed, the AAPI communities have significantly enhanced the fabric, vitality, and well-being of our magnificent city. If variety is the spice of life, New York is truly the most flavorful city in the world. We're thankful that we live in New York, the quintessential American city, yet at the same time, the cosmopolitan epicenter of the globe. It is the capital of the world, not only because of its financial might, cultural depth, media reach, fashion leadership, educational opportunities, technological expertise, and entertainment options, but because New York City appreciates immigrants, exercises welcome, celebrates diversity, and practices inclusivity. Our metropolis, metropolis remains the international heartbeat and pulse because we recognize and rely on the talents and capacities of our multifaceted, multicultural, multilingual citizens, residents, and visitors. We lift up our representatives here this afternoon. May they realize what an incredible privilege it is to lead and legislate on behalf of so many lives. Concurrently, May they remember the awesome responsibility they have as council members who face challenges and make policies that affect lifestyles and livelihood and have reverberations and ramifications not only domestically but around the planet. Therefore, fill each member with wisdom, clarity, perseverance, creativity, and energy especially our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, and our public advocate, Leticia James. Lord God, these are uncertain times with unexpected and unprecedented events breaking throughout the daily news cycle. Through the waves and winds of local and national political turbulence, may this council be ever steady in striving for the common good. May they strengthen New York as the experiment, example, an epitome of what a thriving city can and should be. May they never tire of fulfilling what you require of us, as the prophet Micah tells us, to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, so that New York City endures as a beacon, model, and hope for all the nations, showing that diversity can and must come together in unity without losing flavor and vibrancy. 
And may we continue to be blessed so that we can bless others. We give you all glory, honor, power, and praise. And we pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Oh, Pastor. One second. Quiet in the chambers, please. Shh. May we have quiet in the chambers. Just take your seats. And now, motion to spread the invocation in full upon the record. Council Member Ballone. Thank you, Madam Advocate. Shh. Reverend Dr. Yoonju Kim was born in Seoul, South Korea, and came to the States in 1974 and grew up in Woodside and Whitestone, Queens. She graduated from Cornell University with a double major in American history and music theory. She then went on to Princeton Theological Seminary, where she received her master's and doctorate degree. Over the years, she has served as youth pastor, English ministry pastor, and speaker at several Korean-American churches and gatherings in New York, New Jersey area. Reverend Dr. Kim has worked for the United States Federal Government Department of Commerce Censors in 2000 as a partnership specialist and served as the Queens team leader. She has also worked as a director for the Center for Youth Development in Queens YWCA and is a board certified chaplain and staff chaplain at the New York Hospital Queens for over 10 years. She recently finished her doctorate in church leadership at Fordham University and has been preaching at various churches here in Queens. Reverend Dr. Kim is a member of the Giving Church of New York in Flushing and is interested in the intersection of culture, community, and the church as clearly dignified and seen in her beautiful blessing given today. Thank you, Madam Advocate. Thank you. Councilmember Mendez. I move that the minutes of the stated meeting of April 25th, 20, 2017 be adopted and as printed. Messages and papers from the mayor? None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices? None. Petitions and communications? None. Land use call-ups? M513 and 514. Coupled on call-up vote, ro roll call? Baron. Madam Public Advocate, please. Yes. Uh, before I cast my uh, vote, I just want to acknowledge that we're joined in the chambers here by Jair Froom, who is a graduate from Poly Prep and presently interning at Bolton St. John's. He's majoring in history and minoring in African American studies. And he, is, he has completed his second year at Duke, and I'm especially pleased to have him introduced because he's my godson. Aww. Aww. Jair, where are you? Please rise. There he is. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Shh. Morelli. Yes. Cabrera. Aye. Chin. Aye. Cohen. Constantinidis. Madam Public Advocate, may I be allowed to vote not only on the call-ups, but on, on, the, on the general order calendar today? Yes. I'd vote aye. Thank you. Cornegie. Aye and all. Crowley. Cumbo. Deutsch. Aye. Drum. Aye. Espinal. Aye. Eugene. Ferreris Copeland. Aye. Garodnik. Aye. Gentili. Madam Public Advocate, may I have permission to vote on all land use call ups and general orders? Yes. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Gibson. Aye. Greenfield. Aye. Gordenchik. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Kalos. Aye. King. Madam Public Advocate, I would like to vote aye on all call-ups, and with permission, I'd like to vote on all couple, couple items on the general order calendar and all resolutions. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Ku. I will aye. Thank you. Kozlowitz. Aye. Lanceman. Yes, I'd like to be able to vote um, on all the call-ups, general orders, resolutions, etc. Yes. <laughs> I vote aye. Thank you, thank you, thank et cetera. You. <laughs> Shh, quiet in the chambers, please. Lander. Madam Public Advocate, I'd like to vote solely on land use call -ups. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Levin. Madam Public Advocate, I would like to request permission to vote on all land use call -ups, general or, uh, items coupled on the general orders calendar and resolutions. Thank you. I vote aye on all. Thank yes, you. thank you. Shh. Levine. Vote aye. Thank you. Myself. Mealy. Menchaca. Aye. Mendez. Miller. Affirmative. Palma. 
Madam Public Advocate, I would like to vote aye on all land use call-ups and with permission Shh. vote on the items that are on today's general calendar order. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Quiet down, please. We're having a difficult time hearing. <laughs> Perkins. Aye on all. Thank you. Reynoso. Aye. Richards. Aye. Rodriguez. Rose. Aye. Rosenthal. Aye. Salamanca. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, I would like to vote aye on all call-ups. And with permission, I would like to vote on all call-up items on general order calendar and all resolutions. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Torres. Torres. Traeger. Aye. Ulrich. Vaca. Aye. Thank you. Valone. Madam Advocate, permission to vote aye on all matters on today's call-ups and today's calendar? Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Williams. Aye. Wills. May I vote aye on all call-ups, you know, on the calendar, couple resolutions, and any et cetera that Lanceman covered? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Matteo. <clears throat> Van Bramer. Aye. Speaker Mark Viverito. Aye. Thank you. Today's land use call-ups are adopted by a vote of 42 in the affirmative and zero in the negative. Quiet in the chambers, please. May we have quiet in the chambers as we now hear from the Speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. If I could ask my colleagues to please stand or everyone to please All stand. rise. Over the past week, we have faced some sad losses in our city, in our community here at City Hall, and around the world. I ask for all of us here today to join me in a moment of silence for Lisa Elsman, an 18-year-old visitor, tourist, to New York, whose life was tragically cut short by a drunk driver in Times Square last week. Peter Wertheim, Chief of Staff in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development, who many in this chamber have worked closely with over the years and who unfortunately passed away while attending a family wedding in California on Sunday and to the many victims of the Manchester bombing on Monday. Our hearts are with the families of those lost and our hopes for a quick recovery are with the survivors who remain affected. So I ask for a moment of silence. Thank you, my colleagues. Please be seated. <laughs> Starting off our legislative docket for the day, the council will begin by voting on multiple land use items. The Morningside Heights Historic District, consisting of approximately 115 buildings of various architectural styles in Upper Manhattan, and the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the largest Anglican church in the world, and seat of the Episcopal Diocese of New York, will both receive a vote to determine the designation of landmark status. This is in Mark Levine's district, and Council Member Levine uh, will say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm so pleased that today we'll be preserving in perpetuity uh, one of the most historic neighborhoods in New York City, Morningside Heights, where we'll be creating a new district to protect over 100 buildings, uh, as well as the campus of St. John the Divine. This is a community which, as much as any others in New York City, is defined by its relation to its architectural heritage, a heritage which has been at risk uh, at a time when uh, real estate development is accelerating in the community. Um, and despite the presence of historic districts on all sides, Morningside Heights has remained vulnerable. And I'm so pleased that we will be changing that today. Uh, this would not have happened without 20 years of work from uh, an incredible coalition of community activists, the Morningside Heights Preservation Council, led by Laura Friedman, Robert Stern, and Harry Schwartz, uh, who fought tirelessly to make this possible. And I have to acknowledge the incredible work of the land use team here at the Council, uh, Julie Lubin, Jeffrey Campagna, Jeffrey Ewan, Dylan Casey, Amy Levitin, and Roger Mann. And I must also acknowledge uh, the great partnership of LPC in this effort, including, of course, Chair Srinivasan, uh, the Executive Director, Sarah Carroll, and Lauren George. Uh, again, I'm uh, excited about this historic moment, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. And the Council will also vote on public sightings for two locations in order to facilitate the development of additional public school space for Brooklyn and Staten Island. 357 Targi Street in Councilmember Debbie Rose's district will receive a vote, as will the intersection of Atlantic Avenue and Chestnut Street in the district of Councilmember Rafael Espinal. And I invite them both to speak on these acquisitions. First, Councilmember Rose, uh, and then Councilmember Espinal. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Alleviating school overcrowding in my district is a top priority of mine. And while we've made pro progress in recent years, some schools remain overcrowded, like PS 65, which is 133% over capacity. PS 13 is at 154% over capacity. And PS 78 is at 156% over capacity. Overcrowding not only puts a strain on teachers, but it makes it more difficult for students to concentrate on their lessons, limits innovation in the classroom, and ultimately leads to lower test scores. Today at our stated meeting, we will take a significant step forward toward alleviating overcrowding and ensuring quality educational facilities for children on the North Shore of Staten Island by authorizing the purchase of land at 357 Targi Street. I've been working for months with the School Construction Authority and the Department of Education to identify an appropriate location that would best meet the needs of families in my district. Together, we found 357 Targi Street in Stapleton, an ideal location for a new state-of-the-art school complete with science labs, performing arts space, exercise rooms, cafeteria, and more, including classroom space for more than 800 students. Last fall and winter, we hosted a public review process, and the response from my constituents was overwhelmingly positive. So I look forward to today's city council vote authorizing the purchase of this property so that it can take, we can take it to the next step and ensure quality educational opportunities for North Shore families for generations to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your support. Thank you, Councilmember Spinal. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm really proud to be able to vote today on the siting of a school in my district that actually uh, came out of the East New York rezoning plan. Uh, this will be a thousand seat school uh, in East New York and it will help deal with the current overcrowding uh, in District 19, but also uh, make room for the new residents that are coming in uh, thanks to the rezoning. Uh, this will be a state-of-the-art school. Uh, we'll have all the works, uh, take care of, of, of kids in, in pre-K up to, eighth, to the eighth grade. And it, one of the things that I asked for is to make sure that it had a, a state-of-the-art greenhouse on the rooftop, because I do believe that urban gardening is the future of the city, and I want to make sure that the kids in East New York have the opportunity uh, to learn um, how, how to urban garden and be able to be prepared for when that industry continues to grow in, in New York City. So, you know, I'm really proud to be here today and announce uh, this sighting, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the work ahead. And I would really want to thank all the chairs uh, of the zoning committees, uh, David Greenfield, Peter Koo, and Donovan Richards for all their help, and thank you, Madam Speaker, for put, putting this on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last up for land use, the council will vote on a zoning map change and zone text amendment for 600 East 156th Street in the Bronx. This rezoning will allow for the addition of public parking spaces serving a mixed use development featuring a 450 seat charter school and 175 units of 100% affordable housing. This is in council member Salamanca's district and if you could say a few words. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, today I'm pleased to encourage my colleagues to vote in favor of two land use items that will work to create affordable housing in the Melrose neighborhood of my district. The project that will stem from rezoning is one that the land use team and I have worked diligently on and have carefully negotiated to ensure it fits the needs of my community. This was not an easy process, but I'm pleased to say that today... Excuse, excuse us, Council Member. We have quiet in the chambers, please. We apologize, Council Member. Thank you. Uh, this was not an easy process, but I'm pleased to say that today I feel incredibly confident that these land use actions won't just lead to new affordable housing in the South Bronx, but new affordable housing for the South Bronx. Specifically as a result of our negotiations, additional units have been set aside for families making 30% of AMI or less. Additionally, a new community school will be provided space below the new housing. Finally, this building will be staffed by workers being paid fair wages with good benefits. With that said, I am pleased to say that since taking office in March of 2016, I have worked to secure or create 3,512 affordable apartments for my district. 
and look forward to continuing to the work to ensure all residents of our community have access to quality housing right in their own neighborhood. I would like to thank the uh, Land Use staff, Raju Mann, Amy Levinson, and the Land Use Councils, and Chair Greenfield and Chair Richards on their help and guidance on these projects. Thank you. Thank you. Next, the Council will vote to co-name 53 streets and thoroughfares throughout the city. Among the locations receiving co-namings are the 85th Street Central Park Transverse, which will be co-named for Detective Stephen McDonald, who was paralyzed in the line of duty in 1986 and passed away earlier this year. Metropolitan Avenue and St. Raymond's Avenue in the Bronx, co-named for deceased NYPD Sergeant Paul Tuzulo, and East 7th Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan, which will be co-named for Moises Locong and Nicolas Figueroa, both victims of the 2015 East Village gas explosion. This is one of the many ways that the city works to commemorate lost residents who made substantive contributions to their communities, and I'm honored that the council will be recognizing them today. I want to thank Chris Sartori, Patrick Mulvihill, Kenneth Grace, Chima Obacher, Jen Wilcox, and Ed Atkin. Uh, thank you for your work on those bills. Uh, on the legislative side, introduction 1627A, sponsored by Council Member Eric Ulrich, would permanently change the name of the 163rd Avenue Pedestrian Bridge in Queens to the Joel A. Meal, Saint Pedest uh, Joel A. Meal Street Pedestrian Bridge. Staff is Chris Sartori, Patrick Mulvihill, Kenneth Grace, Chima Obachair, Jen Wilcox, and Ed Atkin. Uh, and I'd ask uh, Council Member Ulrich to say a few words. Oh, sorry, I think he left, so, okay. No problem, moving on. Introduction 1305A, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Salamanca, would require the Department of Parks and Recreation to post notices of the effective date of temporary parking restrictions relating to tree removals at least two days before the commencement of such restrictions. Uh, a lot of work in the Parks Committee uh, for this session. Chris Artori, Patrick Mulvihill, Kenneth Grace, Chima Obachair, Jen Wilcox, and Ed Atkin, thank you for your work on those bills, and Councilmember Salamanca will speak to it. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, today I'm pleased that we're voting on intro 1305, which will require the Department of Parks and Recreation to post notices of the effective date of temporary parking restrictions relating to tree removals on, at at least two days before the commencement of such restrictions with certain exceptions. This legislation was a community-driven effort aiming to provide a simple fix to an issue that can affect all of us in our daily lives. Simply, this bill says that not less than two days prior to the commencement of temporary parking restrictions on any street or roadway for the purpose of removal of trees by the department, the department shall post notice of the effective date of such restrictions on such streets or roadways unless the planned work is to occur in accordance with other existing parking restrictions such as an alternate site parking regulations. Such notification shall include the effective date of such restrictions, the location of such restrictions, and the estimated end date of such restrictions. The department will also be tasked with notifying the community boards where said work is occurring. An exception is made in the bill to allow the department to act when it is immediately necessary to preserve public safety. With that said, I encourage my colleagues to join me in su supporting this bill today, ensuring, ensuring that a community gets ample notice of when all street parking will be affected by tree maintenance simply makes sense, and I'm proud that we're voting on this bill today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Intro 848A, uh, sponsored by Council Member Richie Torres, would require the Campaign Finance Board to include a copy of each voter's voting history for the prior four years, alongside the quadrennially issued voter guide. I want to thank uh, the staff, Brad Reed, Zachary Harris, Rachel Cordero. Uh, Council Member Torres will say a few words about his bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This has been widely caricatured as the voter shaming bill, but. Um, here in New York City, we have a real crisis of low, low voter participation. So the legislation would expand the scope of the voter guide to include one's voter history and knowledge of one's voter history has been shown empirically to boost voter participation. So the point of the legislation, as I see it, is not so much to shame as it is to gently remind people of their most yeah, yeah. basic civic duty. Uh, that's the extent of my comments. So. Okay. Next, we're going to be voting on Intro 951A, sponsored by Councilmember Elizabeth Crowley, which would require existing multi-line telephone systems in certain businesses and city agencies to have direct telephone access to 911, such that a prefix is not required prior to dialing by May 1st, 2019. 
a uh, very common sense bill. Uh, congratulate Council Member Crowley for introducing it, and now we will be voting on it. To the staff, Malika Jabali, Patrick Mulvihill, John Russell, Jen Wilcox, and Ed Atkin. And I would ask Council Member Crowley to say a few words. I want to thank the speaker and Council Member Jimmy Vaca and the Technology Committee for bringing this vote, this bill up for a vote. Uh, unfortunately, it took a horrible situation in which a woman was killed in a hotel room and her young daughter witnessed the murder. She was unable to call 911 because of an access code that the phone had. So this will no longer be the case for any private numbers in the city that uh, in order to dial 911, all you will need to do is dial 911 and emergency help should be on its way. So uh, I thank the speaker for her leadership and I urge my colleagues to vote in support of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And although we are moving into the warmer months, Introduction 722A, sponsored by Housing and Buildings Committee Chair Jamani Williams, looks to increase the minimum nighttime temperature that residential building owners are required to provide tenants during heating season from 55 degrees to 62 degrees, regardless of outdoor temperature. So staff, I want to thank Megan Chen, Guillermo Patino, Jose Conde, Sarah Gastelum, Jen Wilcox, and Ed Atkin, and ask Councilmember Williams to say a few words. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As you mentioned, we'll be passing HO 722A. Uh, minimum nighttime temperatures will bring it up to 62 degrees between October 1st and May 31st, regardless of the outdoor temperature. Uh, I want to make sure I give a big shout out to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who had this bill before me in the council and who co-sponsored it with me uh, this session. The effective date is October 1st, 2017. Uh, I do know it's almost summertime, and so we're time to do this bill. Uh, but we want to make sure we had it in enough time uh, for the heating season. We actually tried to get it done before the last heating season. Uh, there were some, some hiccups, uh, but we're glad that we're able to get it now. Uh, sufficient heat is a quality of life issue that cannot be ignored in the larger conversation of tenants' <laughs> rights, period, particularly if you're talking about people who are uh, otherwise uh, also ill, uh, elderly, and young children. Currently, the outdoor temperatures have to be 40 degrees to require a landlord to turn on the heat. And even in the minimum indoor temperature, temp temperature only mandates it be 55 degrees. I don't think people realize, unless they've been in 55 degrees in their house uh, in the wintertime, how cold that actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition, as HPD testified, it sometimes causes confusion when the inspectors have to come uh, to test to see whether the heating is there if the temperature outside is 41, 42 degrees, 39 degrees, it causes a lot of confusion. In addition, I remember being a tenant organizer, uh, it'd be saddened to have to let tenants know that actually, they actually may be, the landlord may be following the law, they're just allowed to be uh, very cold. So I'm pleased that we were able to work with the administration and my colleagues, including uh, the speaker, to get this bill passed so it will impact thousands of New Yorkers during this next winter season. Uh, again, thank you to the borough president, uh, Megan Chen, Gamma Patino, Jose Conde, Laura Popa, Matt Gawab, Jeff Baker, Ed Atkin, uh, Mike Toomey from my staff, and my former uh, LD and the Deputy Chief of Staff, Nick Smith. Thank you, Council Member. Of our two major legislative packages being voted on today, the first seeks to reform the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals through the implementation of a series of oversight measures and operational improvements. I want to thank on staff Brad Reed, Zachary Harris, and Rachel Cordero. In the interest of time, I'm going to let the members elaborate on the specifics of, e of their bills, beginning with our Majority Leader, Jimmy Van Bramer, on intro 282A. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, to uh, the Chair Kalos uh, for supporting this. Uh, the Board of Standards and Appeals has been a thorn in the side of many of us and many of our communities for far too long. Uh, too often disregarding community input uh, from community members and civic associations, community boards, and elected officials. Uh, intro 282 uh, will uh, change that by adding some transparency and accountability by requiring the board uh, to consider the input of community members, elected officials, and community boards, and when it decides uh, to disregard our views they must spell out exactly uh, why they have chosen to do so, how they've chosen to do so, 
uh, so that communities can respond. In the past, uh, when we were disregarded, uh, they didn't even have to uh, address our concerns, our dissent, uh, and spell that out and telling us how that input was regarded or disregarded and why they disagree with the findings of communities who, of course, know best what is appropriate for their neighborhoods. So I'm, I'm uh, really grateful uh, that this whole package is occurring and that the Board of Standards and Appeal will be forced uh, to uh, respond to communities, listen to communities, address communities uh, when uh, those who want to build out of context and out of character developments uh, come to our community. So I want to thank uh, the speaker, uh, the chair, all of our co-sponsors, and of course my staff, Andres Vija, my legislative director, and Matt Wallace, my chief of staff, uh, for their work on this package. It's a long time coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Introduction 418A, sponsored by Councilmember Karen Kozlowitz. Thank you. Community and borough boards spend significant time and effort on special permit applications brought before them for review. Public hearings, community outreach, special committees, and full board review are common when considering special permits. Community and borough boards should not feel that their recommendation on a matter was discarded by the BSA. Intro 418A would require the Board of Standards and Appeals in granting or denying an application before them to respond to any relevant recommendation filed by a community or borough board regarding such application. Thank you, Council Member. Introduction 514A, sponsored by Minority Leader Steve Matteo, would require that for any term variance granted by the BSA after December 31, 2013, the board shall notify the owner of the property of the expiration of the variance six months in advance. Uh, Councilmember Matteo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we've been discussing BSA reforms for most of the 13 years I've been in government, government as either a staffer or elected official. So I'm glad we're seeing so many uh, meaningful BS BSA bills become law today, and I thank my colleagues for that. The bill I am sponsoring will bring much needed transparency and potential enforcement to a land use matter that is often overlooked. Owners of properties operating with a use that was permitted by a variant should seek renewals in a timely fashion. Too many times I've seen issues come before one of my borough's community boards seeking renewal of an expired variance, all the while the now legal use was continuing. By notifying owners of the expiration in advance and reminding them of potential penalties under the building code, I believe this bill will incentivize many owners to get their acts together earlier in order to reapply for the variance. Quite simply, this bill looks to ensure that property owners apply for this variance in a timely manner. I want to thank the Speaker and Chair Kalos for their support of these reforms. My staff, Brad, Brad Reed and other council staff, for all their work on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we're going to hear from Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee Chair Donovan Richards on Introduction 1200A. Thank you, Speaker, and I'm proud to stand here today to ensure that the Board of Standard and Appeals does its fair share of accountability when it comes to applicants notifying communities and elected officials about applications in their neighborhoods. Intro 1200A will require developers to send applications to council members, borough presidents, and community boards by certified mail or any method that provides proof of service. The BSA is then required to post on its website that the proof of delivery was received and verified. It was shocking to hear that the BSA does not track these instances where applicants do not follow through on this required step in the process. Whether these applicants were trying to sneak by this process or, uh, of notification or were just sloppy, this requirement will ensure that the BSA is working with communities and elected officials to ensure the process is not compromised. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to thank our speaker, uh, Chair Kalos, uh, the Government Operations Committee Council Brad Reed, and my legislative director, Jordan Gibbons. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, quite a productive uh, meeting today, I would say. We have a lot going on. The last five bills in the package were sponsored by Governmental Operations Chair Ben Kalos. They include introductions 1390A, 1391A, 1392A, 1393A and 1394A. Uh, Councilmember Kalos. Thank you. 
One of the many reasons I wanted to serve as the Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations was in order to reform the Board of Standards and Appeals. The BSA is the agency that no one's ever heard of. It's got five members and it has tremendous power over city zoning laws. In the past, developers have been able to circumvent city zoning laws, restricting building forms, use, height, density, and now even affordability uh, without really having much feedback from community boards or elected officials and often over our objections. This package of nine bills contains reforms suggested by the Municipal Arts Society in 1976 and again in 2004 and built on the work of the previous Governmental Operations Chair, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, along with the work of Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bramer, Minority Leader Matteo, and Council Member Kosowitz. Uh, yes, BSA reform is actually a bipartisan issue. Zoning Chair Richards and I were proud to join in this package of reforms, which represents years of work by the Land Use Division and the Governmental Operations Committee. This package of legislation reforms applications, decisions, notifications, staffing, and transparency around the BSA, so it's more accountable to the public. Specifically, the legislation sets minimum application requirements for developers to show why zoning laws should not apply to them with fines as up to $15,000 for knowingly submitting false documents to the BSA. Uh, it designates someone at the Department of City Planning to actually protect their zoning code from the BSA. It provides expertise for the BSA with a state certified real estate appraiser to analyze real estate financials provided by developers. It adds transparency around the number of pre-applications, number of applications, variances approved and denied, and the average length of time for decisions and an interactive online map of all variances and special permits generated since 1998, which was when I graduated Bronx Science. Uh, and that way you can actually see when they're rezoning an entire neighborhood. I want to thank our speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bramer, Minority Leader Matteo, Council Member Koslowitz and Richards for their leadership and partnership. At Land Use, Julie Lubin for her expertise. We are so lucky to have her. Our Governmental Operations Committee, Council Brad Reed, who has spent months fighting for and negotiating these reforms, as well as Rachel Cordero, Smita Deshmukh, and of course my legislative director, Paul Westrick. Thank you to the Municipal Arts Societies for their years of attention to planning our city and perseverance over the years. Forty years later, we're doing it. I believe these reforms will empower council members, community boards, and residents to have a much stronger say in any departure from our city's land use plan and the zoning resolutions. I urge you to vote yes. Thank you, council member. Next, the council will vote on intro 1456A, sponsored by council member Koslowitz, which would require food carts and trucks to post a letter grade that is based on their most recent health inspection by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, council member Koslowitz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I cannot imagine someone not looking for a restaurant's letter grade from our city's health department before deciding whether or not to patronize a restaurant. The A, B, C, or grade pending carries with it real significance. The letter grade has become absolutely essential as it relates to restaurants. Yet, every day, countless numbers of people in New York are expected to purchase food from a street vendor without knowing, knowing to a general degree the cart's compliance with the New York City Health Code. The customers who buy food from a street vendor deserve to have the same ability to make an informed decision as patrons of restaurants. Intro 1456 would mandate that the health department expand letter grading to street food vendors and that it should mirror the restaurant grading system as closely as possible. And I just want to say, as I said before, I can't wait for nine months. I'll meet you at one of the vendors, and I'll buy you a hot dog. Thank and I also <laughs> want to thank <laughs> Committee Chair Corey Johnson and the committee for voting on this wonderful legislation, David Seitzer, and Crystal Pond. Thank you very much, and of course to the speaker who was very supportive of this bill. And I failed to mention congratulations to Council Member Ben Kalos for his BSA bills. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, our final legislation known as the Fair Work Week Package 
looks to regulate ongoing issues with employment practices in the fast food and retail industries. I want to recognize here uh, with us today uh, the president of 32BJ, Hector Figueroa, and, all, and members of that union, as well as, uh, or actually workers, and our WDSU also, and we also have workers here who would be benefiting um, from these packages, this package of legislation. With these bills, we aim to establish a national model for protecting workers' rights, and I am proud of this council for bringing the fight for workplace considerations home to New York City. Uh, obviously, there's so many people on the staff side. I really do want to, first of all, commend Matt Gowalb uh, and all of the staff, Matt Carlin, Alexis Wanzenberg, uh, Terza Nasser, Michelle Lee, Aisha Schomburg, Wes Jones, and Annie Decker, uh, and all of the colleagues that um, have sponsored this legislation. Uh, collectively, they've been working really strong, uh, really solid, really focused on making sure that we pass this legislation to all of the members. Um, Councilmember Brad Lander, Councilmember Johnson, Councilmember Ferreras Copeland, uh, for your advocacy. Uh, similar to the BSA package, I'm going to let the members go into details of their legislation, and we will start off with Intro 1384, which is sponsored by Finance Chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am proud today to sponsor Intro 1384A, the Fast Food Worker Empowerment Bill. This is the first of its kind legislation. It will allow fast food workers to gather their financial resources and focus on the issues that are important to them, enforce penalties and remedies for violations by employers who break the rules, and protect workers against retaliation from employers. At a time the President and federal government continue to gut protections previously available to low-wage workers, working families, communities of color, women and children, it is vital for workers to have the ability to voluntarily contribute to a nonprofit that can advocate for their needs. I want to thank all of my fellow co-sponsors and the advocates who have supported this vision behind this bill. I want to thank my staff, my Chief of Staff, Catalina Cruz, my Deputy Chief of Staff, Ivan Acosta, the staff in the Legislative Division and Committee of Civil Service and Labor for their working in, work, work on this draft and this bill, especially Matt Carin, Wes Jones, Annie Decker, and very, very specifically, Matt mm -hmm. Gowalb and, and Joe Toronto, um, who worked tirelessly way into the wee hours to the very last minute to make sure that this bill included everyone's voice. I also want to thank the mayor's side, um, Emma Wolf, who also engaged in a lot of conversations and a lot of negotiating. I am very proud of this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support and vote this bill also. Um, it is something that fa fast food workers expect and deserve from this council. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, intros 1387A and 1388A are sponsored by Council Member Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this package of legislation is really about fairness. The workers who would be affected by these bills make the lifeblood of our local economy. They deserve respectful scheduling practices and fair wages. Some legislation we pass in the Council works in the abstract, involving broad and overarching policy issues. And sometimes a new policy's effects are not immediately seen. This is not that type of legislation. This will have a direct and immediate benefit to people's lives, replacing uncertainty and dependency with security and economic empowerment. When an employee has to sit by the phone not knowing if he or she will be expected to come into work at a moment's notice, it shows a complete disregard for employers and their needs. When a shift is unexpectedly cut, it takes away a paycheck that might mean the difference between a person buying groceries or going hungry, making their rent that month or falling behind. We're talking about New Yorkers who have families, who have personal lives. Some of them might even have second jobs that they depend on to make ends meet. And with this legislation, employers will now have to show them the same basic respect for their time that we expect in every aspect of our lives. But simply knowing the details of an unfair schedule doesn't make it fair. We have to also address the inequity that forces workers to accept unsustainable requirements placed on them by their employer. When your boss asks you to do something, there is always the underlying subtext of or else. That or else is usually or else we'll find someone else who will. We need to ensure that workers are protected from unreasonable demands by making sure those demands are never made in the first place. Again, employers should be expected to grant their employees the same basic decency we all expect in our daily lives. 
Asking people to work late into the night and return early the next morning on little to no sleep is an abuse of the power dynamic inherent in that relationship and should not be allowed. Confidence in wages and schedules not only assure, will not only assure that workers have food on the table and a roof over their head, but will also help them plan for the future. When your short-term needs are secured, budgeting for long-term financial goals like eliminating debt and saving for retirement become possibilities. Everyone deserves the opportunity to work hard and succeed. It is literally the American dream. How often do we get to help people achieve their dream? I really want to thank the speaker for her leadership on this entire package, my fellow members who worked on this, Councilmember Julius Afreras, and one of the major champions of this, Brad Lander, who's been pushing this for so long. I want to thank them for their leadership. I want to thank Chair Miller and the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, and especially to all New Yorkers whose dedication and hard work inspire this legislation. I want to thank 32BJ and Hector Figueroa, RWDSU and Stuart Applebaum. Today we're joined by the President of Local 1102, Alvin uh, Ramnerain, uh, who is here representing RWDSU. And I want to thank my Deputy Chief of Staff, Lewis Cholden Brown, for his help. And then lastly, Madam Speaker, I just got word, sadly, that there were three individuals just stabbed outside of a school in my district on West 52nd Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, I don't have the details on it, but it just happened about 20 minutes ago. Um, so, you know, if folks could please keep uh, three men, young men, I believe, were stabbed. Mm -hmm. If folks could please keep uh, them in our thoughts and prayers. And I want to thank the NYPD and the first responders that are on the scene up in Hell's Kitchen, ensuring that everyone is safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hopefully, yes, we, we uh, keep everyone in our thoughts. And lastly, introductions 1395A and 1396A, sponsored by Council Member Brad Lander. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Almost five years ago, a small group of fast food workers in downtown Brooklyn went on strike uh, and launched and sparked a national movement of fast food workers demanding $15 an hour and a union and some dignity for folks who had previously been seen as shift workers, as part-time workers, as low-wage workers, without rights, without dignity, and what they started there in Brooklyn five years ago has swept across the country, has changed the way we look at fast food workers, the way we look at organizing. Thanks to their work, 22 million workers across the country have seen job, uh, minimum wage increases, including 10 million on the way to $15 an hour, thanks to the organizing that they did and everyone in this city. Um, so I want to just recognize a few of the workers who are in the room with us today. Violetta Luis, Chantel Walker, Kenneth Brister, Charisma Ivy, Pierre Metivier, Julio Martinez, Viani Vargas, Rosa Rivera, Jorel Ware, Jorel Ware, and Amber Granham. Thank you guys for your power, for your courage, for your organizing. It is because of you that we're doing this today in the council, and it's because of you that that organizing is sweeping across the country. Um, I also want to recognize the leadership of both SEIU 32BJ uh, and of the RWDSU for supporting worker organizing, your own members, and folks who've got nobody helping uh, support and organize for them. Uh, it's really powerful because that $15 an hour that folks want in this state is great, but if you don't have enough hours to put together a work week that you can pay the rent or pay the food on, or if you don't know what your schedule is going to be in advance and it's not stable enough for you to organize your child care or your education, um, it's not much good. And so the work we are doing here today together and I really want to thank the Speaker and Councilmember Ferreras and Councilmember Johnson because these bills function as a package. 1396A requires that fast food employers provide two weeks advance notice of their schedule so fast food workers will know when they're going to work and if employers change the schedule afterwards, they have to pay a premium for doing so so workers have predictability um, and can cover if they have to make adjustments. Um, and intro 1395A will make sure that workers that want to get more hours and want to get to full-time work so they can pay their bills have a chance to do so by requiring that before employers post a new hire uh, notice, they have to offer those shifts, those hours, to existing workers so those who want to can get more hours and can get to full-time jobs. 
put together with the other bills in this package, with the ban of on call uh, and with the Fast Food Empowerment Act, it is a tremendous step forward. Um, lots and lots of people helped, and I will not name them all, but I just want to add my voice of thanks to the Matt Gawal, Manny Decker, Wes Jones, Matt Carlin, Alexis Bonsenberg, Michelle Lee, Aisha Schomburg, and Tirza Nasser in the Ledge Division, um, and on my team, to Annie Levers, who did an extraordinary job helping shepherd this package along. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Brad, and thank you for your strong advocacy. And before we close out, I really uh, want to wish everyone a happy Memorial Day and a traffic-free long weekend, right? Uh, and also invite you all to stop by the Rotunda on your way out today to view the It Takes Us Stories from Across America uh, anti-gun violence photography exhibit, which is sponsored by myself, Council Members Dan Garodnik and Jamani Williams. I really want to thank Dan, for uh, Council Member Garodnik, for bringing this to my attention and really being a strong advocate for it. Uh, the underlying stories associated with each picture reinforce the notion that we, as a representative body fighting every day for our constituents, must continue our work to prevent the spread of gun violence. And I'll ask uh, Dan to say a few words about it and introduce the photographer. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, uh, for uh, your uh, sponsorship of this, uh, uh, these photographic portraits. Uh, these portraits are the work of Joe Quint, uh, who is a documentary photographer who has been traveling the country to capture the stories of people whose lives have been affected by gun violence, whether they're injured survivors, family members of victims, and the witnesses who, while not physically injured, bear emotional and psychological scars. I just want to introduce you to Joe. Joe, just stand up and give a wave over there. That is Joe Quint. Let's give him a round. Each portrait, and I encourage you to take a look out in the rotunda and also in the members' lounge, gives you a small but powerful insight into the real human cost of the gun violence statistics that we talk about so regularly. Each story is unique, yet all share the common thread of our country's shameful record of easy access to these tools of murder. Joe hopes that his work will inspire action on the issue of gun violence, and I share his hope because the statistics are horrifying. Every day in America, over 300 people are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, and suicide attempts, unintentional shootings, and police intervention. Of those, every day, 93 die, including, on average, seven children. Think about that. That's every single day. Domestic abusers are five times more likely to murder their wives or girlfriends when there is a gun in the house. More Americans have died from guns in the United States since 1968 than on battlefields of all of the wars in American history. The people you will meet in these photographs are only a few of the hundreds of thousands of victims of guns. We cannot allow this to continue. The photographs will be on display today uh, in the rotunda in the members' lounge, as I noted, and in the speaker's office, and I hope you will take a few moments to view these compelling images. Uh, I was moved. I, I want to thank the speaker for her willingness uh, to display these photographs, as well as to Council Member Williams for his advocacy on this issue and also support of this exhibition. And to Mr. Quint, thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Thank you again, Dan, for your advocacy. The, the, the you know, images really are powerful, so really would encourage people to just take a quick uh, swing by the rotunda and also downstairs and uh, thank you so much for sharing those photos with us uh, and yes we do honor obviously and and have Memorial Day coming up so definitely a way as a reminder uh, to thank and and remember all those veterans that continue to serve uh, each and every day on our behalf and that have given of themselves to defending our country so thank you for that and keep them uh, in mind as we celebrate Memorial Day and Memorial Day weekend and finally I want to welcome seniors from Older Adults Technology Services, OATS, who are visiting City Hall during their civic day today. I hope they're still here with us. So thank you for being here. Uh, and with that, I conclude communications from the speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let us continue to pray for all of those who have been victims by active violence, both here and abroad. And congratulations to all who will now have predictable schedules. Let us begin our general order discussion with Councilmember Eric Ulrich. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I want to apologize 
uh, to the speaker. My colleagues before when I uh, was called upon, I was not in the chamber, to speak on the bill today uh, that we are voting on, which will officially rename the 163rd Avenue pedestrian bridge in my district, uh, which spans over the Hawtree Basin after uh, a true public servant who served uh, and had a, a stunning career in three mayoral administrations, was a constituent of mine after uh, the late uh, Joel A. Mealy, Sr. Um, Commissioner Mealy was first appointed in 1990 by Mayor Dinkins to serve as a member of the City Planning Commission. Excuse me, Council Member. May we have quiet in chambers, please? We apologize, Council as I, as I mentioned, Madam Public Advocate, uh, Joel Mealy was first appointed to serve the people of the city as a member of the City Planning Commissioner by the Dinkins administration. In 1994, uh, he was appointed by then Mayor Giuliani to serve as the city's Commissioner of the Department of Buildings uh, before he was asked to serve as the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection uh, between 1996 and 2002. Uh, when Mayor Bloomberg took office, he asked Commissioner Mealy to stay on, but in a different capacity, um, asking him to serve as a commissioner of the Board of Standards and Appeals. So uh, he's had a storied career in our city's uh, history, spanning three mayoral administrations. He was also uh, the chair of the local uh, community board uh, for almost two decades, a deeply respected individual uh, from people on both sides of the aisle. Uh, he died, unfortunately, in 2013. His family still resides in Old Howard Beach in my district. And this pedestrian bridge, which we are voting to name in his honor and in his memory, uh, will serve as a fitting tribute uh, for his family and friends who uh, knew him well and knew that he represented the embodiment of public service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Council Member Deutsch. Thank you. Uh, today we are voting on a street co-naming that Council Member Traeger and I introduced, uh, which will take place at the intersection of Brighton Beach Avenue and Coney Island Avenue for Larry Savinkin. Larry Savinkin was born in 1955 and raised in Odessa, Ukraine. He immigrated to the United States in 1996, settling in New York City with his wife and two children, Galina and Vladimir. On September 11, 2001, Al-Qaeda terrorists struck New York City, killing 2,996 innocent people. One of those victims was Vladimir Savinkin, Larry's 21-year-old son. Larry and his family turned their pain into purpose. He and his wife, Valentina, sought out other New Yorkers who were suffering through the same circumstances, and they formed a non-for-profit organization, the September 11th Family Group. Dedicating, dedicated to honoring the memories of those who were lost. With Larry leading the way, the group built a 9-11 memorial in Asselievy Park on West 5th Street in my district. The memorial is a beautiful, peaceful place for families to visit and remember their loved ones. And every year on September 11th, Brooklyn comes out to memorialize the thousands we lost in 2001. Larry continued to be active in local matters, organ, organiz, organizing cultural events for his fellow New Yorkers, joined, joining the community board 13, serving on the Holocaust Memorial Committee, and also working for Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Larry was a proud husband, father, and grandfather when he passed away on March 6 of this year. He was a friend to everyone and all who counted on him for a helping hand, and his impact on the Russian-speaking community of New York and all who knew him will be long-lasting. Like the 9-11 memorial in Asselia Park has done for his son, the streets that will be co-named after him will stand as a testament to the life and accomplishments of Larry Savinkin. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Council Member Traeger. Uh, public advocate, I will uh, reserve my remarks because I'm speaking about a bill that I'm introducing later on. You reserve your remarks for general discussion? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, I'm, You're going to reserve your remarks for general discussion? Well, I wanted to talk about a street co-naming. You can do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to start by congratulating all of my colleagues on the Fair Work Week bills. These are important and significant pieces of legislation that will change the lives um, of many uh, uh, hourly wage workers, uh, especially in the fast food industry, and I want to thank them for 
um, you know, working so hard to get these bills passed. We're also voting to celebrate an extraordinary labor and civil rights leader from our past as we vote to co-name the northwest corner of Columbus Avenue and 71st Street in honor of Mrs. Ponzi B. Hillman. Mrs. Hillman was an incredible teacher, fighter, and leader, and we were so blessed that she made the Upper West Side her home. Mrs. Hillman spent her whole life fighting for justice and for human dignity. From her courage teaching at freedom schools in uh, southern districts resisting school integration, to her trailblazing work with the UFT, to tireless advocacy on behalf of Upper West Side seniors. Her dedication to improving the lot of others touched so many lives across the city and across the country. It's a great privilege that we have a chance to commemorate her life today. And I just want to emphasize um, the piece, the work that she did uh, trying to step out in front of those who would resist school integration. This issue always brings a divisiveness. And what Mrs. Hillman did was stand up for what is right. And I am so proud that we'll have a street co-naming in her name. We'll interrupt now for two votes. Councilmember Greenfield. Thank you. I'd like to request permission to vote on the general order calendar and all resolutions. Yes. I vote aye. Thank you. Councilmember Gorodnik. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Vaca. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilmember Crowley. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I'd like to have permission to vote on all land use items and all bills today. I vote aye. Yes. Thank you so much. Now back to general discussion. Councilmember Rodriguez. I first would like to vote aye on all land use colors and all general order. Yes. Uh, vote aye. And second, I would like to say a few words with about great street code naming that we are great street code naming that the council we allow to do in our community. First, we do in the uh, we are co naming a street after the father of, of the great police officer Boxer. So we co naming take Boxer away after. It, in, in the borough of Manhattan, we are also condemning 168 between Broadway and Fort Washington after the great Dr. Sander, who also used to run the armory at 168 and passed away in the last couple of months. We are also condemning 168 in Amsterdam Avenue after the Mirabal sisters, the three women that they were killed by the dictators of Trujillo. And I also, we are condemning 168 in San Nicolas Avenue after Albert and Dorothy Rose Blomberg Way who were a family that dedicate to open opportunity for those immigrants, this case Dominican, who were arriving in Washington Heights area. And it was because of their support that we started getting some political participation. With that, I vote aye. Thank you. Council Member Barron? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Public Advocate. I want to just comment on two co-namings in my district. Well, yes, two in my district. The first one is Susanna Mushat Jones Avenue at the corner of Vandalia and Louisiana, Louisiana Avenue. Ms. Jones was called by those of us in the community Miss Susie, and she held the distinction of being the oldest living woman, the oldest living person at the time that she passed. She was 116 years old. Uh, she still had her faculties. She had lost her vision, but she still had her faculties. And when we asked her, we'd say, Miss Susie, what do you attribute uh, your long life to? She said her diet, and I'm sure some of us would question that because she would have eggs, bacon, and, and hominy grits every morning. Wow. And she believed in chewing gum, so she had her chewing gum. But she lived in the Vandalia houses, and she served in the tenant patrol until she was 90 years old. And she had the distinction also of founding a scholarship fund because she had limited educational uh, abilities, uh, opportunities rather, in Tennessee, but she established a scholarship fund for other people that they would be able to benefit from that. The second person is Horace Morancy Way 
and Horace Maranti, you probably know the name. He fought to bring vital social services to the residents, and he developed many programs to address uh, community issues, including housing, job training, and domestic violence. He was selected by former Mayor Lindsay to lead the Central Brooklyn Model Cities program. And recently, in 2012, the Caribbean American magazine entitled Everybody's honored him for his immense contributions in promoting the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. And I also want to say that Miss Susie's hometown renamed the highway in her honor as well. So she has that distinction in her hometown as well. I have others, but I'll do them in the next part. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, I want to comment on three uh, co-naming that will take place also in my district. We know that uh, New York City, we, in New York City, we have uh, great people, outstanding citizens, who made tremendous contribution to our city. And I'm privileged uh, to have uh, three or four of those people living in my district. Uh, and, and, and I want to mention uh, uh, the, the best thing for their contribution to uh, the community. Uh, two wonderful people, the rabbi and uh, his wife, they have made tremendous contribution to our society, to our city, and I'm so pleased that we are going to name the square after them. And I want to take the opportunity also to commend Rabbi Yaakov Berman and also Rabbi Moshe Penson uh, at the Shabbat for the uh, advocacy. Thank you very much. And I want to mention also a wonderful lady, Barbara Simon. I don't think that I can uh, use any word to express how uh, wonderful she was and to express, to talk about uh, tremendous contribution to the community. And I'm pleased that we are going to co-name also a street after her. And I, may, I want to mention also Lenore Bridge, also a wonderful person who have made also uh, a wonderful contribution to the community. I'm so delighted to see that the city council is going to vote to co-name those uh, public places after those wonderful people. And I want to thank all of those wonderful people who have worked hard to make this uh, condemnation possible. And thank you also, Madam Speaker, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Reynoso. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Madam. <laughs> um, I want to talk about three condemnations in my district. Tilly Tarantino Way. Uh, she was born an Italian immigrant to Italian immigrant parents. Tilly resided with her family in Leonard Street in Winnesburg before they purchased a home in the 1950s at 64 Concelia Street. This uh, house was also the place where she would live and raise her children. Tilly was instrumental in galvanizing the community to the man facility space and helped found the Small World Swinging 60 Center and later served as his executive director for almost 40 years. Uh, she was also a founding member of Greenpoint Renaissance Enterprise Corporation and active member of Community Board One. We also have David Pagan Way. David Pagan was born in Barranquitas, Puerto Rico, and raised in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. He was a veteran serving in Vietnam as an infantryman in the Air Cavalry Division. Uh, David Pagan is known for his leadership in founding Southside United HDFC, or Los Sures, and serving on the boards of citywide organizations advocating for tenant rights and working families. And finally, Luz Yolanda Coca, or Jolie, was an extraordinary person committed to her faith and the power of community. Originally from the Dominican Republic, Yolanda lived and raised her family in Bushwick, Brooklyn. She was a graduate of Boricua College and worked as a VISTA volunteer with the Fifth Avenue Committee. Uh, she is a member of St. Joseph's, Joseph's Church and Bushwick Housing Independence Project since 2005. Um, I want to thank the speaker and the city council for their upvotes on these uh, street renamings for my district. Thank you. Thank you. And now for a vote, Council Member Gibson. I vote aye on all, and congratulations to all my colleagues on voting on important legislation today. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Thank you. And now back to the regular scheduled calendar, the reports of special committees. None. Reports of standing yeah. committees. Oh, yeah. Report of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Intros 1384A, 1387A, 1388A, 1395A, and 1396A retail and fast food employees. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Finance, preconsidered LU 640 and Reso 1487 through LU 642 and Reso 1489, tax exemptions. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Governmental Operations, intros 282A, 14A, 418A, 514A, Board of Standards and Appeals. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 848A, sending voting history 
to voters. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intros 1200A, 1390A, 1391A, 1392A, and 1393A Board of Standards and Appeals. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 1394A, adding variance and permit information to city website maps. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Health. Intro 1456A, letter grades for mobile food okay. vendors. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Intro 722A, dwelling minimum temperatures. Amended and coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Land Use, LU 604 and Reso 1490, tax exemption. Coupled on general orders. LU 607 and Reso 1491, uh, Sagua Cafe. Coupled, on, uh, coupled to be filed pursuant to letter of withdrawal. <coughs> Excuse me. LU 608 and Reso 1492 and LU 609 and Reso 1493 zoning amendments. Coupled on general orders. LU 610 and 611 zoning amendments. Approve the modifications and refer to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Rule 11.70B of the Rules of the Council and Section 197D of the New York City Charter. L excuse me, LU 614 and Reso 1494, Maritime Lease. Coupled on general orders. LU 615 and Reso 1495 through LU 627 and Reso 1499 and page 7, tax exemptions. Coupled on general orders. LU 628 and Reso 1500, Morningside Heights, Historic District. Approved with modifications and coupled on general orders. LU 629 and Reso 1501, Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine. Coupled on general orders. LU 633 and Reso 1502 and LU 634 and Reso 1503, Sidewalk Cafes. Coupled on general orders. LU 636 and Reso 1504 and LU 637 and Reso 1505, School Facilities. Coupled on general orders. LU 638 and Reso 1506 through Pre-considered LU 646 and Reso 1509 on page 9, tax exemptions and mortgage loan. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. Intro 1305A, parking restrictions related to tree removal. Amended and coupled on general orders. Pre-considered intro 1613, naming of 53 thoroughfares and public places. It, uh, coupled on general orders. Pre-considered intro 1627, Joel Mealy Pedestrian Bridge. Coupled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Technology. Intro 951A, telephone access to 911 service. Amended and coupled on general orders. On the general order calendar, LU 610 and Reso 1510 and LU 613 and Reso 1513 through 613 and Reso 1513 on page 11, zoning amendments. Uh, coupled on general orders. Resolution appointing various persons, Commissioner of Deeds. Coupled on general orders. I dare say I think this is probably one of the meetings where we've had the most legislation and actions to be taken. Uh, uh, coupled on general orders, the Commissioner of Deeds, and I ask for a roll call vote on all items. Uh, Baron. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Advocate. I'm voting aye on all with the exception of Land Use 616, in which I'm voting no. It is the second part of the library project, and I think that what we did when we established that, uh, that project was we moved from having a poor door in a building to having a poor building at a remote location. So with that, I'm voting no on land use 616 and the accompanying resolution. Thank you. Borelli. I and all accept intro 1384, 1387, 1388, 1395, and 1396. Cabrera. Uh, Madam Public Advocate, um, Madam Speaker, uh, today is a good day for fast food employers, and I congratulate all the sponsors of the bill with that vote aye. Chin. Congratulations to all my colleagues on these important legislations, and congratulations to the fast food workers. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Cohen. Uh, I vote aye on all with the exception of intro 722A. I abstain on. Carnegie. Combo. I vote aye. Deutsch. Aye. Drum. Aye. Espinal. I vote aye. Eugene. I would like to vote uh, aye in all the land use call up, and I vote aye in all. Yes. Thank you. Ferreris Copeland. But congratulations to all of my colleagues today. I vote aye. Gordenchik. 
Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, first, I want to congratulate all my colleagues on their legislation. As the speaker said, it is a long day here. I want to congratulate Eric Ulrich on the uh, renaming of uh, Joel Mealy Bridge. Joel was truly a Renaissance man. He was an admiral in the U.S. Navy, and he did more for the people of the city of New York than they will ever realize. I also want to congratulate uh, my colleague uh, Costa on the renaming for Jimmy Lanza, who uh, worked with former Borough President Shulman to save the apartments of 20,000 families during the last call-up and condo crisis of the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, myself, we are proud this day for my first street renaming uh, for Father John Murray, a former associate pastor of America Mars Church on Union Turnpike, who worked for a generation to save the lives of people addicted to drugs and suffering from alcohol abuse. Uh, this Memorial Day, I will remember my father, my father-in-law, a hero of the, the war in the Pacific, and my dear friend Alex Jacob, who we lost about a month ago. He was a native of the Lower East Side and was a hero at the Battle of the Bulge. And as he lay there dying on a riverbank, he looked up to see two African-American soldiers from General George Patton's army who indeed saved his life. He lived to be 91. He was extremely involved in our community. With that, um, I vote aye on all except intro 1396. Thank you for Thank you. indulging me. Johnson. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. I, I want to first congratulate Councilmember Karen Kozlowitz for her leadership on this issue, getting uh, letter grades for food vendors and mobile food carts in New York City. This is a New York City issue. This is an issue that the council should be have oversight on. I know that there were some folks in Albany who were trying to take this away from us, and I am glad that the council took action here today because this is within our purview, and I was really glad we were able to do this. I think it's a great piece of legislation, so I wanted to uh, thank her for that. I want to congratulate all my other colleagues, and I want to take the rest of my time to remember Peter Wertheim. Peter was a great, great guy. I am hugely saddened and heartbroken over his untimely passing. I knew him before he worked for Deputy Mayor Glenn. Mm. I knew him when I was chair of Community Board 4, and he was the number two guy at the Hudson Yards Development Corporation. He and I worked together. He and I then worked together to get the Hudson Yards Hell's Kitchen bid through the process. And when he joined Deputy Mayor Glenn's office, he was a consummate professional, thoughtful, funny, charming, responsive, charming, just a great, great, great guy. And it is a huge loss, 39 years old, huge loss to lose a guy like Peter who has given so much to the city and really took his service to this city seriously. He has a husband, they were married a few years ago, and Peter was just a tremendous person. I know that Deputy Mayor Glenn's office and the folks that work there are mourning, and that so many folks on the other side of City Hall are mourning, but for those of us that got to work with Peter, we know what a great, incredible New Yorker he was, and we'll miss you very, very much. My condolences to his husband and to his family. I vote aye on all. Kalos. I and all. Ku. Uh, I will I, and I also want to congratulate uh, Council Member Karen Kostovich for passing uh, two important bills today. Congratulations, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, and bless you. Kozlowitz. I vote aye. Lander. Request permission to explain my vote. Just a few more thank yous. First, I want to thank Chair Miller, who chaired a fantastic hearing on this package of bills. It was long. We heard work testimony from a lot of workers, and there were a lot of issues to work through. So thank you, Chair Miller. Um, I <coughs> thanked Corey before, but I want to thank Lewis Cholden Brown. Um, Councilmember Rose was a big supporter of this package, and her staff are Edwina Martin. Um, we are lucky to have with us a lot of the leadership from 32BJ, uh, not just Hector Figueroa, but Allison Hirsch, David Cohn, Catch and Locke, and Candace Tolliver as well as Camille Rivera from RWDSU, and certainly Stuart Applebaum and Jessica Garcia were big supporters 
Um, from the Center for Popular Democracy, Carrie Gleason is here, and thanks also to Rachel Deutsch and Elian Farhat. And A Better Balance uh, did a lot of work here as well because this is about helping workers have the possibility even of some work-life balance, so thanks to Sherry Lewent and Phoebe Taubman. Um, the new Office of Labor Policy and Standards, which this council helped create, has become a great ally in supporting and defending workers, and DCA Commissioner Lorelai Salas, OLPS Director Liz Fladek, Amit Baga, as well as Joni Kletter and Lindsey Green were a big help on getting this home. Uh, and in my office, thanks also to Whitney Hugh and Rachel Goodman. Um, thanks to all of them and to all of you. Hi on all. Levine. Permission to briefly explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. Well, um, Madam Speaker, you're right. I think we hit a record. Uh, I counted almost 40 bills today. Uh, really a lot to be proud of for this council, the BSA reform, uh, the work we're doing for voter participation and, and uh, healthy food vending. But I do particularly want to say how proud I am about our package of bills for supporting the rights of fast food workers and retail workers and um, express my gratitude to the sponsors, uh, Council Members Johnson, uh, Ferreris, uh, Lander. I uh, particularly want to note uh, intro 1384A, which will give workers a chance to pool their resources to make sure that their voice is heard. Uh, really a simple and powerful notion uh, that I'm proud to support. And intro 1387, which will finally give workers uh, the stability, predictability, and transparency in their scheduling, which they've so long lacked. And I hope and expect this will set off a trend nationally so that people see that even at a time when workers are getting no help from Washington, that local government in progressive hands can push forward bills that score real wins for working men and women. And I'm very proud to vote aye on all today. Thank you. Myself. Mealy. I vote aye on all, and I salute to all my colleagues for their legislation and all the war, war, war veterans that are saving us right now. And keeping the borders safe for all of us. And I vote aye on all. Thank you. Menchaca. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I want to also thank all uh, our colleagues in the City Council for their hefty agenda today that we're passing. Um, I also want to lift up the voices of the workers. Uh, not only do we have to thank 32BJ uh, and the incredible team there, um, our WDSU and their team, but really the workers are who I want to lift up today, the, those who came to my office, that came to uh, camp out at the City Council uh, these last few months and really made sure that their voices were heard. Uh, their voices were heard, Yoletta, Charisma, Pierre, who I keep on seeing all over the place, uh, and when he speaks his truth, he speaks power. Um, this is the kind of way that democracy needs to work. Uh, when legislation is debated, when the people most impacted can come and tell their story, that's how it works. And so I want to say thank you. Keep doing it. Uh, we are not done yet. Uh, this package represents a lot of work, but we have a lot more to go. Uh, so I want to thank the Progressive Caucus for really taking, taking this uh, not only seriously, but making, that, making that, th those wheels of democracy churn for goodness and justice. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Carnegie. Aye on all. Miller. Permission to explain my vote, please? Yes. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, first, I, I, I want to commend my colleagues on the uh, Fair Work Week legislation and all the legislation that is being passed today. That is really, really important, vital uh, uh, legislation being passed to protect a, a community that has been void of a voice, and I'm proud to be a part of that. I especially want to thank the Speaker's Office and those at uh, uh, 32, uh, 32 BJ, uh, RSDWU for their advocacy, but the Speaker's Office for indulging me as we, in this legislation, attempt to capture and, 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 and work towards uh, resolving some of the issues of our target audience in the fast food industry, but also to be able to protect the broader labor movement. And so um, I, I really want to thank those who have worked diligently and above and beyond to ensure that all these things have happened. So those members of the Labor Committee, um, Matt Gawal and uh, Joe, um, and also uh, Liz Vodick and Terry McGinnis, people who have worked really hard to ensure that this 
important legislation was the right legislation and that it continued to um, advance the labor movement here in New York City. So I, 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 with that, uh, I again want to thank all those involved and I bow eye on all. Perkins. Aye on all. Reynoso. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Congratulations to all my colleagues and uh, to the colleagues that are left in the chamber. Uh, MSQI, or the Middle School Quality Initiative, is hosting a debate in the committee room next door right before the Black Latino Asian Caucus meet. Everyone's invited. We're going to see uh, two schools, two middle schools, debate against each other regarding issues of immigration. And it's a school in my district and a school in Richie Torres's district. Um, it's going to be uh, very positive and, and intense, hopefully, in, in a positive way, of course. Uh, but also just speaking to MSQI, uh, the actual grades and proficiency levels of schools that have the MSQI program have consistently gone up across the board. And it really speaks to the work that these, uh, the MSQI, or the initiative, is doing in our schools. And I hope it eventually could come to every single school in the city of New York. But really excited about seeing the two middle schools debate today right after this in the committee room. Thank you very much. And, and uh, public comment. Thank you. Richards. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, first off, I wanted to congratulate all the sponsors of the Fair Work Week uh, legislation today. I especially want to uh, highlight intro 1387, um, which creates predictability, establishes stability, creates transparency, and enhances, enhances workers' rights. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think all of these bills help us achieve a medium uh, with the retail establishments and workers by basically treating our workers with respect and dignity uh, while they uh, seek to earn an honest living. And I think these bills strike the right balance. Um, I also just wanted to speak on, uh, uh, and lastly, let me just say a congratulations to Councilmember Jalissa Ferreras, Lander, and Johnson, to RWDSU, 32BJ, and especially to workers. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight two street renamings. Um, uh, one is going to a gentleman, Julius Freeman, who was a Tuskegee Airman who we recently lost. Uh, he served his country with pride and, and, and dignity. After his service as a Tuskegee Airman, Mr. Freeman had a prominent career within the car industry, serving customers such as James Brown and Brooklyn Dodgers Pee Wee Reese, regardless of color. Among Mr. Freeman's many accolades, he has been awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by former President George W. Bush, the Rosa Parks Award from the Lakeview Democratic Club, the Gold Award from Chrysler, and was invited to the inauguration of former President Obama. And then secondly, uh, Mr. Walter Kelly, who was a well-respected jazz musician, uh, who played on the Ed Sullivan Show with, Ray, with the Ray Charles Band and toured with the hit Broadway play Sophisticated Ladies, just to name a few of his many accolades. Mr. Kelly really dedicated uh, a lot of his life and work to the Robert Cal Senior Center in our district, which uh, many uh, community members from council members, both Wills and uh, uh, Miller, reside as well. Uh, he was a great man uh, who we truly miss, and uh, his wife just left the center from what I know as well. Uh, but we want to definitely pay homage to him too, and I think these two street renamings are a small token of appreciation for the work that they've done. So with that, I vote aye. Thank you. Rodriguez. Rose. Permission to um, explain my vote? Yes. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge all of the hard work, and I do mean hard work, that my colleagues put into getting the Fair Work Week package together and, um, and actually um, voted on today. And um, I'd like to uh, say that I will continue to work to make the right to request flexible schedule um, legislation a reality, and I want to thank 32BJ and all of the advocates for, the, for their work and commitment to this package of bills. Thank you. Rosenthal. I am not. Thank, you. Thank you. Torres. I at all. Thank you. Traeger. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Yes. Uh, I also just want to uh, commend uh, Councilmember Kosowitz for her food safety bill. Um, I, I also just uh, want to echo the remarks of my colleague, uh, Councilman Deutsch, uh, with regards to the street renaming uh, for Larry Savinkin. Larry uh, was a pillar in the Russian-speaking community and organized his family and other families that lost loved ones in 9-11. 
uh, towards dedication of a memorial in southern Brooklyn. So I echo the, the comments of my colleague. And to my colleagues who championed the fair work week uh, package of legislation, just to, again, we've heard this before, but just to humanize it a, a, a second further, a worker who closes an establishment at one in the morning should not be the same worker required to open the same establishment five hours, six hours later. That's outrageous. And so we're very proud to support uh, this package of bills. Uh, and with that, I, I vote aye. Thank you. Ulrich. I vote aye on all with the exception of intros 1384, 1387, 1388, 1395, 1396A, all A. And uh, I'm going to abstain on intro 722A uh, for environmental concerns, which were expressed yesterday at the hearing. Thank you. Rodriguez. Aye. Williams. Pass. Matteo. Um, no on 1384, 1387, 1388, 1395, 1396, I and the rest. Van Bramer. I don't know. Williams. May I excuse me, my vote? Yes. Uh, first, I just want to say congratulations uh, to all my colleagues. Uh, it was pretty long, but we actually did some very good bills here uh, from uh, Karen Kozlovich, Richie Torres, uh, um, uh, Councilmember Crowley, they were like very good bills. I do want to give a special shout out to Councilmember Perez, Lander, and Torres. Uh, a few years ago, uh, what Councilmember Lander described, uh, I helped shut down a Wendy's and at, on Fulton Street, I'll never forget, at the start of this whole thing, uh, did an impromptu boycott, and I've been so proud to see where this has gone uh, since then. It is something from the $15 an hour, something that people said could not be done, uh, something that said will never be done, that folks are crazy. And as Councilmember Menchaca said, the voice of the people really stood out here. Uh, people who felt they had no voice previously, were, voices were strengthened, and it's a shining example of what can happen when people stick together and don't say no, don't take no for an answer. Uh, the progressive movement, the reforms we're pushing for. This is a great example of from the bottom up and, and staying united. So I'm proud to vote aye on all of these bills, uh, knowing that this is not uh, a completion, but this is a continuation. Uh, we have a long way to go for the workers in this country, but 32BJ, RWDSU, all the people that I represent, all of the fast food workers, hopefully you are immensely proud and really understand what you're doing here as a shining light, not just for yourselves, but for fast food workers and people who are fighting to feed their family across this country, even magnified uh, during this age of the orange man. I vote aye. Sorry, sorry. I vote aye on all, with the exception of LU 616 and resolution 1496, which I vote no. Speaker Mark Viverito. Thank you. All items on today's general order calendar were adopted by a vote of 50 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, with the exception of intro 1384A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions. Um, and intro 722A, which was adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, zero negative, and two abstentions. And land use 616 in resolution 1496, which was adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, two negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 1387A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 1388A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 1395A, which was adopted by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, three negative, and zero abstentions. And intro 1396A, which was adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, three negative and one abstentions, and the re revised land use call-ups vote is 50 in the affirmative and one negative. Introduction and reading of bills. Introduction and reading of bills. All bills are referred to the committees as indicated on the agenda. Thank you. And now we will have a uh, discussion of the resolution, resolution 
1444 and 1445, sponsored by Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Shh. Quiet in your chambers, please. We, if you are exiting, please exit quietly. We are still in session. Thank you. Thank you again, Pub Madam Public Thank Advocate. You. Shh. First, Resolution 1440 affirms the city's right to collective bargaining, and secondly, uh, Resolution 1445 urges Congress to vote against proposed national right to work laws. Um, all these things uh, are, are the basic tenets and foundation for organized labor. Organized labor, which brought us the 40-hour 40, uh, 40 work week, worker safety, uh, labor standards, health and retirement benefits. The city has a great tradition in providing uh, such benefits. That is why uh, the first Labor Day parade was held here and that we, are, we are, have an obligation to continue to lead in this way and in organizing. In these times, we are, we, where we are void of social safeties and being threatened by right to work all over the country, we are, we are creating laws here today that enforce the rights of workers, but also we must reaffirm the rights that have given us the quality of life for so many workers around the country and here in New York City today. When union powers are weakened, so are the workers and so are the communities that they represent and live in. Studies have shown that when union membership decreases, so does wages, and we cannot allow that to happen. Proposed budget cuts that come out of Washington and the changes that we will see and the implementation that the Labor Department will have serious consequences on the workers right here in the city. So this is why we are reaffirming the right and basic tenets of collective bargaining and to right to organize and we denounce right to work, which is certainly not the right to work. So I thank um, my staff for putting this together. I ask that my colleagues vote in the affirmative in this important legislation, and we are on a roll in protecting workers. So I'd say let's vote yes and get it done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now seeing no other speakers, let us begin by um, voting on resolution 994, resolution calling upon the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and all other appropriate entities to support a Hudson River Greenway between Spiten Dival and Yonkers to provide riverfront access in a continuous, continuous stretch concurrent with the Metro North Line extending from Manhattan to Westchester. All of those in favor say aye. aye. All of those opposed? Any abstention? The ayes have it. And resolution 1444, a resolution affirming the right to collectively bargain for workers in the city of New York. All of those in favor say aye. All of those opposed? Any abstentions? The ayes have it. And resolution 1445, a resolution calling upon Congress to vote against the proposed right to work legislation. All of those in favor say aye. aye. All of those opposed? Any abstention? And the ayes have it. And now to general discussions, beginning with Councilmember Barron. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. First, I want to call my colleagues' attention to Reso 1481, which prohibits third parties from obtaining copies of homeowners' deeds. And you can understand why that's being introduced. It's something we want the state to look at. And I just do want to talk about two of the other, actually three of the other people who are having street code namings. Barbara Simmons, who lived in Brooklyn. She was bold, outspoken, relentless on educational issues, not only in her community, but across the world, across the state. And she formed and participated uh, in several educational advocacy groups. And next, Ilambe Brath, whom we called a walking encyclopedia. He was a great Pan-Africanist. He was the founder of the Patrice Lumumba Coalition. He was an advocate for the right to self-determination for Angolans and South Africans. And he established the Grandassa Models, which were a group of dark-skinned women, black women with huge afros, and they wore their cultural attire. And he showed us that, yes, black is beautiful. And finally, Ramon Jimenez. He was a lawyer trained at Harvard, yet he brought his skills and talents back to the Bronx, the poorest congressional district in the nation. And he was a professor at Hostos, and he helped to lead the fight to maintain Hostos as an independent, unique institution and not be absorbed with another college. 
Uh, in 2010, he ran on the Freedom Party line for Attorney General, with Charles Barron running for governor. And he fought against corruption, cronyism within the system, and while Hostos, he said, while Hostos was an old tire factory with a $4 million budget, the city saw fit to give all kinds of grants to Yankee Stadium in the millions of dollars. And he finally said, any reward that I get for what I did is because of the people I was around. We have too many great leaders who want to rise from the people, not with the people. Even good people get hypnotized by power. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also, uh, let me restate some, the tally vote on intro 1395A, it was adopted by a vote of, excuse me, intro 1396A, it was adopted by a vote of 46 in the affirmative, four negative, and zero abstentions. Now continuing with general discussions, Council Member Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I want to wish uh, uh, all my Haitian brothers and sisters a uh, happy Flag Day that we just passed this past week. Also, just to point out that uh, we were fighting for TPS to be extended to the Haitian community. We were very worried about what would happen. Truth be told, we had the struggle under the Obama administration as well. Uh, and President Trump, the orange man, extended it for six months, which was ridiculously uh, low. Normally it's 18 months, uh, but expectations were so low, I guess we had to take this as a celebration. Uh, I do believe it is uh, part of uh, the ignorance of the administration to believe that Haiti will be in a much better position in six months. Uh, and I think part of the uh, taking away the humanity of uh, these people who are here legally because of what happened in Haiti from the earthquake to cholera to the hurricane, <clears throat> to live, have to live under a cloud. Uh, I don't think people understand what it's like to uh, have a, a life, a family, trying to get a job, and know that you may have to leave this country in six months. I don't believe that you can deport 16, 60,000 people. I actually don't believe you can deport millions of people, like we say. But what it does is keep them subjugated under a second class status while using and abusing the talents that they provide uh, for this country. Uh, lastly, I would like to uplift uh, Second Lieutenant Richard Collins III, who was stabbed to death in the University of Maryland um, uh, by a white supremacist. His name has not been ringing out in the news. Um, we haven't been asking the questions of how this white supremacist has been radicalized. He was a young black man set to graduate. Uh, he served his uh, country. And these are the types of things that are happening and unfortunately does not get the attention that it deserves, I believe, because who is uh, being killed and because of the people, what they look like, who are killing them. This should be receiving as much attention as any other terrorist attack uh, that is occurring. Uh, with that, I would wish everyone a Memorial Day, uh, including uh, my brother who will soon be enlisting, who has enlisted and soon will be shipped off uh, to the Navy. Uh, my prayers are with him and all others. <coughs> Councilmember Miller. Um, actually, we were out, but now that I have the floor, um, I'm going to be introducing a introduction uh, workers' compensation. Last week, the governor and the state house announced that workers' compensation rates would be reduced by 4.5 percent. While this was hailed as a, to support small business, the fact of the matter is that there are many other ways that we can reduce the cost of workers' compensation while still supporting small business. The city paid almost $300 million of workers' compensation claims last year, but almost nothing is being done to see that steps are being taken to prevent such injuries. That is why that the legislation, intro 1622, will require the, the, the law department of the City of New York and OMB to create a quarterly report which will not just show the money that is being spent on workers' compensation, but it will also determine where the injury took place, how many claims, who, and the title, so that we can prevent them from happening in the future. It can take over a year to receive a determination from Workers' Compensation Board, which is why this report will show when the claim was filed and, and when the payment begun. Let us be clear, workers' compensation is something one is not something one, is something one not something one uses to support their family, but is the lifeline when people are injured through no fault of their own when serving this city. That is why it, it, in, in my prior life we fought to raise 
the, the workers' compensation in, this, in the country. We are now 17th behind states like Alabama. A 4.5 reduction is an abomination to the workers that serve this city. So um, I'm hoping that my colleagues can support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Public Advocate. Colleagues, I ask you to please uh, join me and also Councilmember Allen Mizell in supporting intro 1626, a bill which would create safe internet, exchange, uh, internet purchase exchange zones throughout the city. Each police precinct would be required to designate a monitored location where New Yorkers can go to safely exchange goods purchased on the internet arranged through websites like Craigslist. Two weeks ago, someone selling gift cards through Craigslist was robbed at gunpoint in his hotel room. Earlier this year, a Stuyvesant High School student was stabbed and robbed while attempting to sell sweatshirts in a purchase arranged through Facebook Marketplace. Cities throughout the country have adopted the Internet Purchase Exchange Safe Zone model, responding to changing modes of commerce, including Hartford, Connecticut, Seattle, Washington, Philadelphia, uh, Miami, Houston, and San Antonio, and many others. This common sense bill would allow New Yorkers to conduct simple financial transactions in a safer manner while allowing each precinct the flexibility to designate a location within or near the precinct house to set appropriate hours and to utilize existing security video infrastructure. No one, whether they're trying to downsize and earn a little extra cash before a move or chasing a coveted rarity, should fear uh, for their safety. I respectfully urge my colleagues to sign on to intro 1626 and also just want to echo the remarks of the speaker and my colleagues wishing all of our veterans, armed forces, and those that we have lost a uh, very happy, blessed Memorial Day. Uh, we, we must always uh, show respect to our veterans, not just with words, but with actions. Thank you, Public Advocate. Thank you. Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, bring up three different uh, introductions, or an introduction and two resolutions. Introduction 1621, this is in partnership with Councilmember Johnson. This local law will amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to clarifying that gender reassignment surgery that will result in sterilization is not subject to a waiting period. Um, two resos, 1484 and 1485, and this is in joint with the Speaker of the City Council, uh, calling on the state and the federal government to extend protections for undocumented youth by passing New York State Dream Act of 2017 at the state level, as well as bar removal of individuals who dream and grow our economy Bridge Act of 2017 at the federal level. These are very important conversations to keep going in this time, uh, and I'm glad that the City Council will be uh, reviewing this through the Immigration Committee and back up uh, for, for uh, an affirmation. Uh, the next one, 1485, this is a resolution calling upon the Department of Homeland Security, John Kelly, to prohibit the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE agents, from identifying themselves as police officers while conducting immigration enforcements in, the New, York, in New York City. Um, these are the tactics that we see over and over again by ICE. Uh, it's wrong on so many different levels. And thinking about public safety in our city, we know that sanctuary cities are cities that are actually safer because we build relationships, strong bond relationships with our local law enforcement. Uh, and so I'm really thankful uh, for both of these resolutions. Thank you. And lastly, Council Member Lander. No. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. To close us out, uh, I would like to invite my colleagues to join on Saturday for a pretty special demonstration, and you too, Madam Public Advocate. Uh, uh, there will be a high school student-led demonstration for New York City's school integration and desegregation, led by the remarkable young people of Integrate NYC for me this Saturday at 1 on the City Hall steps. They have been building an extraordinary campaign uh, and have been partners with this council in moving the issue forward. There is so far to go here. You may have seen recently the mayor made some comments that expressed some skepticism about how urgent this is to do. And I would just urge you to come listen to what these young people have to say Saturday at 1 on the City Hall steps. We'll also be seeing them back in this chamber before too long. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize. One more speaker. Um, Council Member Drum. Thank you very much. And just a reminder that we have right next door uh, right after the stated meeting, the middle school student debate and spoken word poetry presentation by the Middle School Quality Initiative. So we hope everybody will stick around and uh, come to the debate uh, right next door right now. Thank you. To close this out, the speaker, Melissa Macarita. Everybody wanted to...
to that do. we remember uh, we are in recess so with that thank you to all my colleagues and enjoy the rest of your day thank you enjoy memorial weekend